to our study through the book of Exodus. Today, we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 2. In our last video, we examined Exodus chapter 1. We talked about how God's people, Israel, found themselves in slavery in Egypt and now found themselves being oppressed. We, of course, ended chapter 1 by discussing the courageous actions of the Hebrew midwives uh, who refused to kill the male children as they were being born. Well, this actually led to another decree from Pharaoh at the end of Exodus chapter 1. And verse 22 says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. So a new decree telling everyone for the Jewish people, when you have a son, you need to throw him into the Nile River. In other words, to his death. And the daughters can live. Again, an attempt by the Egyptians to control the population of Hebrews, who under the blessings of God were multiplying rapidly into a great nation. The same promise that God made to their patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, had received these promises of becoming a great nation. We're seeing that come to fruition here in the beginning of Exodus, and so the Egyptian people were beginning to enslave them and trying to control the population in these manners. As we come to Exodus chapter 2, we begin to meet, so in Exodus chapter 1, we were introduced to the primary conflict of this book. In Exodus chapter 2, we meet the primary human character of the book, the one that God is going to use to rectify this problem of his people being enslaved in Egypt. And so we meet Moses. Well, in the first few verses of chapter 2, we see how Moses, after his mother gives birth to him, his parents decided to hide him from Pharaoh for three months to save his life, because again, all male babies are supposed to be thrown to the Nile River. And it tells us in the first few verses that after she could not hide him any longer, um, the, it was too, becoming too difficult, or the, he was getting older and starting to make more noise, um, after she could not hide him for any longer, then she put him in a basket and set him on the Nile River, presumably again to his death. And yet, that is not what happened. The Nile River carried his basket down near to the palace in Egypt, palace of the Pharaoh, where Pharaoh's daughter was happened to be out in the river at that time bathing herself. Okay, they did not have running water, and so this was what they would do from time to time. So she was bathing herself, and her servants were attending on her, when she discovered this basket floating in the Nile, and she wanted to know what it was, asked one of her servants to go and get that basket for her. And inside, of course, they discovered the baby Moses. Now, she had a dilemma, because apparently at this point in time, she was still fairly young, um, and she needed someone to help her to nurse the baby. She did not know uh, where the baby was going to be fed, how the baby was going to be taken care of in that regard. But it just so happened that Moses' sister had been following this basket down the Nile. I don't know if Moses' parents were aware of this, but Moses' sister had been following the basket down the Nile, and at this point, as she was hiding in some bushes, hearing the Pharaoh's daughter ask for a nurse, or where are we going to get a nurse for the child, uh, Moses' sister jumped out and said, I know a woman, a Hebrew woman, who can do it for you. And so Moses was actually returned to his mother and paid by the Pharaoh's daughter to nurse him for her. And when Moses was old enough, she was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and was, he was raised in the palace of Pharaoh as one of Pharaoh's own children, even though he was a Jew. Now, of course, this is a tremendous demonstration of God's providence in protecting Moses from harm, in providing for his life. But there arose an issue. We find out in verse 11, one day when Moses had grown up, uh, scholars believe that around this time he was about 40 years old, so about 40 years later, one day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew one of his people. 
He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So Moses, seeing one of the Egyptian taskmasters being especially harsh with one of his people, that rubbed him the wrong way, and so he took action and killed the Egyptian taskmaster and buried him in the sand. The next day, it tells us in the next few verses that Moses went out and saw two of his fellow countrymen, two of his fellow Hebrews, his, the Jewish people, uh, quarreling with each other, getting into an argument, and as Moses stepped in to try and serve as a mediator to quell this dispute, uh, this is what they said to him. Uh, verse 14, Who he answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So at that point in time, Moses realized that his killing of the Egyptian taskmaster was not a secret. Perhaps, apparently, he thought that no one knew it. Uh, but now he knew that someone knows about it. It's not going to be very long before the news gets back to Pharaoh. And then I'm going to be punished, possibly put to death myself. And so Moses runs out into the desert. He just runs to get away from Egypt, not really knowing where he was going to, to go um, as he's trying to flee from the wrath of Pharaoh. And he discovers a well out in the desert. And there, by the well, he ends up running into these seven daughters of what's called, the Bible calls the priest of Midian. Now, uh, the nation of Midian has some roots and traces back into the book of Genesis. We see their origins a little bit in the book of Genesis. We're not going to get into that in the scope of this video series. Um, so this group of people named Midian, their priest, and his seven daughters come to this well. And what was happening typically was there were these group of shepherds who were preventing them from coming to the well to draw water for their own animals. So Moses sees this, decides that this is not something that needs to happen, and he helps to drive away the shepherds for them so that they can get water for their flock. So when they return to their father, their father is amazed that they're able to get back so quickly because usually they have to hassle with these shepherds to get water. Um, and so they tell him about Moses, and he says, well, bring him home and let's see what's going on. And so what ends up happening is Moses ends up living with this man, the priest of Midian, and the man rewards Moses by allowing him to marry his own daughter, Zipporah. So Moses ends up living and staying with uh, these people, this family in Midian. And so once again, we see how God is providing for and protecting Moses, even in a difficult circumstance. So we've seen that in his birth. We've seen that now in how after he committed a murder and he ran out into the desert, God still gave a family to provide for Moses' needs. God's providence truly is incredible. But then we come to where we really want to focus on in this chapter, in the last few verses, beginning in verse 23. It says, During those many days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, the our memory verses. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. So meanwhile, Moses is living out in the desert, away in exile from Egypt. He tells us that the people of Israel began to cry out to God in anguish because they're suffering under bondage. This is not what God promised to their ancestors. He promised them a land of their own, many descendants, blessings. That's not what they're experiencing. And so they're crying out to God in their anguish. And yet, God hears them. In fact, in the life of Moses, as we've already seen, God is preparing the solution to their suffering. God is preparing the one that he is going to use, the vessel through whom he can deliver salvation to his people from their slavery. And so it makes all of the little minor details about Moses' life and upbringing that much more important 
which is probably why the Holy Spirit chose to include those details for us in the Bible, because they're very important to see how God the entire time was orchestrating the events of Moses' life so that he would be where he needed to be at the exact moment in time that God was going to deliver his people from slavery in Egypt. Again, we see some parallels here to the birth of Jesus Christ who brought salvation for all people from the slavery of sin, from bondage to sin. Jesus Christ's birth and early life also had similar circumstances in which human rulers sought to destroy him. If we remember from Matthew chapter 2 in the story about King Herod, who sought to destroy the life of the early of Jesus when he was a baby, the Messiah. And yet God, in that instance as well, guided and directed events to protect the life of the one who would be the Savior of the world. Again, God's providence is incredible. We know that if he provided for his people by protecting Moses, we know that if he provided for us by protecting Jesus until the appropriate time when he should die for our sins, then we know that God even still today is providing for and protecting us, right? That's what providence really is. It's just the everyday provision and, pro and protection that God offers to us. Not something necessarily miraculous, we see God interacting in miracles, and we'll see that later in the book of Exodus, but most of the time, God chooses to encourage us, God chooses to provide for us, God chooses to protect us and strengthen us through his everyday providence. Just the little things that maybe sometimes we overlook. We see in the life of Moses here that God had a plan for what he was going to do. He heard his people's cries, and he was already preparing the solution. Again, I pray and hope that something said here today would minister to your heart, that you would share it with everyone that you meet. Um, thank you, and God bless.